one, it was an amazing, not amazing. It was a very savvy time for Connor to sell because he is fresh off the loss, knockout loss of Dustin Poirier. And he blew up this brand, this whiskey, whiskey brand on the strength of his persona, his invincible. I'm at the top of the heap within fighting. I'm a megastar. Have no qualms about it braggadocio type persona that he has what up what up folks what's going on welcome to the spun today podcast the podcast that is anchored in writing but unlimited in scope i'm your host tony ortiz and i appreciate you listening This is episode 177 of the show, and in this episode, we have another segment of Goats Doing Goat Shit, featuring both Conor McGregor and Joe Rogan. I also speak about watching UFC 260, as well as Zack Snyder's Justice League. But before we get into all that, here's a quick way that you can help support this show. If you do any shopping on Amazon, like most of the world, I ask that you do so by clicking on any of the Amazon banners on my website. This will take you to Amazon where you can do your shopping like you normally do. It will not cost you anything extra, but I will get credit for driving traffic to their website. Speaking of Amazon, they fulfill a bunch of the merch that I have available. If you go to spuntray.com forward slash support, you're going to find a brand new merch section where you'll find the iconic Podcasts vs. Anybody, super soft, premium cotton t-shirt. You'll also find the legendary Spun Today Podcast tee, which is in the style of the New York City Plastic Thank You Bags logo. For my fellow Dominicans out there, I have a dope Dominican Escudo t-shirt. You know where the Lacoste or Polo shirts have their little logo? Picture that, but instead, a Dominican Escudo. All available now in a variety of different colors for men and women in all sizes. In the Spun Today merch section, which again is at spuntoday.com forward slash support, you'll also find a bunch of other t-shirt designs, long sleeve t-shirts, short sleeve t-shirts, color changing coffee mugs, and much, much more. Check out all the merch at spuntoday.com forward slash support. First up in goats doing goat shit. Mixed martial artist superstar Conor McGregor just sold his stake in the spirits company that produces Proper 12 Whiskey for $156 million to Beckel, which is the Mexican company that owns Jose Cuervo Tequila. Here's how that story unfolded. In 2018, the company Beckel helped Conor McGregor and his manager, Audi Attar, with the financing to launch Proper 12 Whiskey. Keep that in mind. That's going to be important later. And I'll repeat it real quick. The company Beckel helped Conor McGregor and his manager, Audio Tar, with the financing to launch Proper 12 Whiskey. This was back three short years ago in 2018. And for those of you that don't know, Proper 12 Whiskey is a whiskey that Conor McGregor started. Uh, he purchased a distillery in Ireland, and it's named after uh, his uh, hometown where he grew up, etc. And he's been popularizing it using, you know, his stardom over the past three years. Within the realm of spirits, it's like a direct competitor to other Irish whiskeys like Jameson, for example, which is the leader in that space. Then after being launched, that same company, Beckel, purchased a 20% stake in this new whiskey company. Then they upped their stake to 49%. The other 51% owned by Connor, along with Audi Attar, who has some unknown percentage of that 51%. I don't know if he's just getting a management commission of that 51% or if he has some order, some other split that we're not aware of, that's not public, or at least that I wasn't able to find. And now that same company, Beckel, purchased the remaining 51% stake worth $156 million, which raised Conor McGregor's net worth to $278 million. Now, two things I want to touch on aside from the obvious, impressive $156 million return on investment within three years. 
and you know 156 minus whatever the dealings of that initial financing help that Beckel assisted in facilitating. One, it was an amazing, not amazing, it was a very savvy time for Connor to sell because he is fresh off the loss, knockout loss of Dustin Poirier. And he blew up this brand, this whiskey whiskey brand, on the strength of his persona, his invincible, I'm at the top of the heap within fighting, I'm a megastar, have no qualms about it, braggadocio type persona that he has. You know, this is a guy that had a, a fairly me- meteoric rise within the UFC, was the first, I believe the first, two-division champion. He, like, was unstoppable until Nate Diaz, but then continued on another run after that, after avenging that loss to Nate, then was stopped, obviously, by Khabib, was so big of a persona that he finagled a professional boxing match with arguably one of the best boxers ever in history, definitely one of the best defensive boxers in history with Floyd Mayweather, and reportedly made over $100 million just in doing that. So he went from UFC to boxing, lost there, obviously back to UFC. And in this lead up to the Dustin fight, which was the second fight that they had, I covered it in a previous episode, uh, Conor McGregor knocked out Dustin uh, the first time they fought as part of that meteoric rise that I just referenced. And Dustin got the better of him and knocked him out very convincingly during this bout. But leading up to this, Conor was already like looking past Dustin, you know, after beating Dustin, he was negotiating a bout with a, another boxing match with Manny Pacquiao. So he has like this badass aura about him being able to, you know, traverse sports and, you know, just based on his marketing ability, being able to warrant these huge money fights with other huge megastars. And that's all part of his brand and his image and why the popularity of Proper 12, aside from being like good business and him getting, being able to, to work into his dealings to get sponsorships, to being, being a sponsor of like UFC events, being a sponsor of boxing events. But it's all kind of sort of riding on that persona, right? So once Dustin stopped him as convincingly as he did, and it was via, stri- via striking, it was standing up, he got knocked out. I'm sure the negotiations with Pacquiao went out the window. Like that took the wind out of the sails of that. Wherein he then turned around and sold his remaining stake in proper 12, recognizing that. I'm sure if he would have beat Poirier the hype behind the Pacquiao fight would have been as big as it was behind the Mayweather fight. And if that was the case, he wouldn't have sold proper 12, I believe. And I've heard other folks say similar things, so I, it's definitely not an original thought, but I completely agree with that, with the logic behind that that statement. Because the branding underpinning that value would have increased with a win against Poirier and a hype behind a potential Pacquiao fight. So it was definitely savvy on his part to sell when he did so kudos to connor and audi Attar for recognizing and executing on that and the last thing i want to mention about the deal how ill of a chess move is it from beckles standpoint so beckles is the mexican company that owns jose cuervo tequila how ill is it of them to notice and seemingly having this calculated from the beginning to they go from assisting with the financing, putting Connor and his manager in touch with with whoever they had to put them in touch with to get the financing to start this proper 12 journey. Then they invest a 20% stake after launch. Once they see the returns on that, they increase their stake to 49%. All the while probably knowing that every dog has his day, right? When it comes to, to sports, especially within the fight game. At which point, from their perspective, and this is me speculating, obviously... Let's let this guy popularize this brand as much as possible, increase its value as much as possible. And when the time is right, we being their biggest partner in the deal, we'll give him an offer he can't refuse and buy him out. And we'll continue doing what we do, what we know how to do within the spirits game. And that's exactly what they did. They took that 49% stake and then bought out the remaining 51% when the time was just right. And that's Conor McGregor and Goats doing goat shit. Next up in Goats Doing Goat Shit is Joe Rogan, my unofficial podcasting mentor, as I know he is for so many others within his orbit. So for those of you who don't know, aside from being the host and creator of the largest podcast on the planet and someone who's been on a couple of syndicated shows, 
since syndicated shows, as well as the a top tier and most popular commentator for the UFC. Joe Rogan is also a stand up comedian and arguably has been not arguably he was before all of that other stuff. It's his passion, his main thing to do. And he was a comedy store comic. The comedy store, for those of you that don't know, is the comedy mecca. It's the comedy club mecca. Any and all comics worth their salt, that's where they want to be. That's where they want to get past. Especially on the West Coast, here on the East Coast, in New York specifically, they the closest to that is the comedy cellar. And there's actually a great documentary about the comedy store on Showtime that you all should check out. But in short, comedy has had always had like highs and lows over the years in terms of like its popularity. But the comedy store has always been a constant in terms of being that place, the place where the heavy hitters go. And Rogan was a comic there, uh, paid regular there. And there was this now infamous beef between him and Carlos Mencia. Carlos Mencia was a very popular comic back then, had like a Comedy Central uh, TV show. And he's known to be a joke thief, like literally to the point where other comics would come up with ways to let other comics know by like turning on certain lights within the comedy store um, to let other comics know, yo, Carlos Mencia is here. Don't use your good material when you're on stage because they knew that he would just steal it and and write it off as, as his own. So Rogan being Rogan confronted him publicly on stage after like so many other comics were literally robbed by Mencia and he did so on stage in a now infamous clip that I'll try to find and link to it within the episode notes if you guys want to check it out. But pretty much Carlos Mencia went on stage defending himself. Rogan was there on stage with him and Brian Redband, which was the person that started the Joe Rogan Experience podcast with Joe Rogan um, as his uh, producer, uh, which is the role that Jamie has now filled. He was there recording it on like his cell phone, like recording the incident. That's why we have the footage. Long story short, at this confrontation and other comics being like, yes, finally, you know, somebody, you know, like stood up for us. There was a new management at the comedy store because Mitzi was already like elderly and, and ill. And Mitzi Shore, the person who started the, the comedy store, or actually not started rather because it was started by her husband, but who gained the comedy store from the divorce and made it to what it became at this point in time, even though, you know, Rogan had his like uh, fear factor and news radio syndication money and stuff like that. He wasn't the like cultural icon that he is today. Right. And he wasn't at, like as big of a comic. Meanwhile, Carlos Mencia was at the peak of its popularity. He was super popular around this time. And the comedy store management sided with Carlos Mencia. And this is even though, again, it was like a, a, a different management, but even though Rogan had, you know, been there for years and he himself like paid for like the sound system within the comedy store and, and there's like other stories like that that have been corroborated. And like he, they were under like the same management, apparently Rogan and, and Mencia. So it was like a big thing. And his management even told Rogan that he should apologize to Mencia because Mencia is like the moneymaker for them or whatever, quote unquote, at that time. Uh, Rogan made the decision to, after telling them, and he tells the story, he's like, after telling them, are you sure that you want to, in this situation, back someone who's knowingly stealing from other comedians? You want to back a thief in this situation? And he had, like, the backing of every single comic there. They said yes. They went with Mencia. Um, Rogan then decided to, either his management dropped him or he fired his management immediately. And he left the comedy store and vowed not to go back. That since obviously blew up in their management's face and and the comedy store as well um because it became like a ghost town thereafter and again i wouldn't just attribute that to rogan um because like i I said before the you know comedy always has like ups and downs in terms of its popularity but i'm sure that that was a significant part of it because other comics followed to like the joey diaz's tom segura's etc but the comedy store is still the comedy store you know it's still the mecca of comedy and there was a comic by the name of ari shafir shout out to ari Ari Shafir, Skeptic Tank, check it out. One of my favorite comics, despite the Kobe fiasco. Ari Shafir, who started as a door guy at the comedy store, meaning working there, like, at the door to be able to get five minutes worth of stage time. 
Rogan used to take him and a lot of other Thor guys and people that worked at the comedy store um, on the road with him, like to open for him. And after, I think it was like seven years or so of Rogan never going back to the, to the comedy store. And during this time, the Joe Rogan podcast became or was on its way to becoming uh, what it is today, but was already like wildly popular. Um, Ari Shafir had worked his way up from being a, uh, a door guy to, to obviously an, an opener and then middling and becoming a headliner. And he was getting to shoot his first comedy special. And he actually shot it at the comedy store. And he obviously like wanted uh, Rogan to be there, you know, being someone that, that was so impactful in his career. Carlos Mattia stole jokes from Ari as well, by the way. There's like back-to-back videos uh, of their jokes online that you can find. And Rogan made the decision for that, for such a special occasion to do so, to go back uh, for Ari. And he didn't want the like attention to be on him going back. So he went back like a couple days before uh, the actual shooting of the special just to, you know, take the, I guess, like the attention away from him going back to the comedy store away from him in time for when Ari shot his special. And then at that point, comedy store was under new management, which had previously, you know, for years tried to get Rogan to go back. Um, but this actually made him finally go back. And then by this point, the comedy store and comedy in general, largely attributed by the way, to the Joe Rogan experience podcast and all the comics that he had on there and, and telling comedy stories and stories of being on the road and stuff like that comedy was on the upswing again in terms of its popularity but then it went to a point where it just blew up and the comedy store and a lot of this is covered in the documentary as well was like on an idle tuesday completely packed lines around the block on any given night you can see 10 different headliners that you would normally pay hundreds if not thousands of dollars for doing 15 20 minute workout sets etc and sadly, due to COVID and all the shutdowns and like the Uber regulations within California, specifically LA, it's been shut down ever since for like over a year with no like end in sight, even though like they tried the comedy store management because, you know, they serve food and stuff like that there. They tried to have it reopen, you know, do the whole outdoor thing, you know, through all the rules and regulations, following all of that and maybe have a stage outside, outdoors where folks could still perform comedy, but that wasn't allowed. And those strict, seemingly obtuse regulations that were imposed, even when folks were following the rules and regulations on the books, led folks like Rogan to leave LA. And a lot of comics followed suit. So Rogan relocated to Austin, Texas, and is on a mission to starting a new comedy mecca if you will in austin because he doesn't want what was started and maintained for such a long time within the comedy store and in la uh the la comedy scene to die again remember it's his passion it was his, like his main thing to do before the podcast before ufc before all this other stuff and he actually wants to open up a comedy club and i've even heard him say like at cost and like not profit from it or whatever which would be nuts and make zero business sense but when you have fuck you money from spotify i guess it's not as much of a factor. <laughs> um, definitely one club, maybe even two, to have like a separate like workout club for like comics starting out. Um, he definitely said at least two open mic nights and stuff like that. And but anyway, the dope thing is that like a lot of like comedy is beginning to happen because uh, you know Texas is like less restrictive. And oh, it's actually where. Dave Chappelle in the segment that I had of Goats Doing Goat Shit with Dave Chappelle and the whole Comedy Central Chappelle show thing um, where that was shot at Stubbs Barbecue. That was a part of like shows that Rogan and Chappelle do together, which sidebar, like they, they were doing before, pre-pandemic, they were doing arenas together, headlining arenas together, stadiums together, Dave Chappelle and Joe Rogan. And the scene that he's establishing is, is such that Chappelle, who lives like remotely, like in Ohio somewhere, is even considering moving to Austin as well. But we'll see if that happens. I don't see that happening really. But other comics that have moved to Austin, which makes this uh, comedy scene even more likely, more promising, are Brian Redman, Tony Hinchcliffe, Tom Segura, Christina Pazitsky, Tim Dillon, Burke Kreischer's on the fence. He's a maybe. Joey Diaz, 
Rogan offered to like buy him a house, move his whole family, all types of shit. But Joey actually moved out to here to the East Coast, back to Jersey, where he's from. Rogan's still holding out hope that after after a winter or two, he's gonna say fuck this weather and and <laughs> move out to Austin. Theo Vaughn moved to Nashville. Andrew Schultz is currently in Florida. Supposedly, Hippocrates is saying that it's for you know a couple months while it's cold in New York, but we'll see. But it's a lot of folks and a lot more that are supposedly going to make that move. And it's going to be really interesting to see what Rogan is able to build out there in Austin, Texas. And I'm excited for it. I'm excited for comedy and can't wait to see what's going to be coming down the pike. And that's Joe Rogan in Goats doing goat shit. UFC 260. Sugar Sean O'Malley beats Thomas Almeida. In the third round with about a minute and change left to go. O'Malley looked really good during this fight. There was some talk around his ankles being weak and being shot after his previous loss to Cheeto Vera. Where either stepping wrong or getting leg kicked a bunch fucked with his ankle and his leg was just like unusable apparently during that fight. Then he got swarmed. This was his first fight back from that and he looked great. Dancing around, dominating, being flashy, very visually appealing fight from that perspective. He was out striking Almeida uh, going into the third. He was clearly up two rounds. I think some cards had the first round as a 10-8 round from striking, which I'm no expert, but I believe that's rare. You normally see like a 10-8 round when somebody just gets like taken down and ground and pounded for like the full round or, 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 you know, more than half the round, etc. Or like really convincing things happen. Like almost knocked out and stuff like that. Which wasn't the case in the first round. It was just like straight striking and dancing and dancing around type of thing. And actually I take that back. Because I I was thinking it was the second round. But I think it was the first round where O'Malley head kicked Almeida. And knocked him down. And he did his usual like walk off knockout type of thing. Which I like by the way. on, On two fronts. One, it just looks badass. Like that cocky like one hit and then just walk off like yeah that guy's knocked out before the ref even stops it but also from the perspective of the guy that does get knocked out who sometimes we see you know taking extra damage that could be avoided like two or three extra hits after them being knocked out before the ref is able to like jump in and stop the fight so from that perspective it's kind of better for them as well in my opinion i know refs don't like it because they're like yo i stopped the fight not you but still Anyway, so O'Malley gets this head kick and starts to do a walk-off, but the ref doesn't stop it, and Almeida kind of sort of like comes to, continues the fight, which is just like a testament to how tough he is. But then after that, O'Malley, you know, continues dominating, and in the third round, with a minute and change left, Almeida was coming in, and O'Malley was able to rock him, I think it was with the right, to the point that he was able to like, literally like mush him, to like push him down to the ground. And Almeida like rolled back onto his back and O'Malley, O'Malley, O'Malley sort of kind of just like walked up towards him and like threw like one precise right onto him and like knocked him out and the ref stopped it. It was a dope fight. Definitely looking forward to Sugar Sean O'Malley's next fight. Tyron Woodley versus Vicente Luque. Tyron Woodley versus Vicente Luque. Tyron lost in the first round towards the latter part of the first round via submission. I'm a Woodley fan, always have been, and it sucks to see him lose, especially this is his third, maybe even fourth loss, I think third loss in a row, but maybe even fourth since losing the title to to Usman. And he came in hot during this fight, just throwing haymakers. And what's crazy is that he cracked Luque a couple times hard, but Luque is obviously no slouch. And during... One of their stand-up exchanges, Luque was able to like crack him back with a right, I believe. I always say right, probably because I'm a writer. <laughs> even though I don't remember exactly if it was a right or a left, but he cracked him and stunned Woodley to the point that he like backpedaled to the to the cage, and Luque was able to to swarm him, take him down, and caught Woodley in a very tight Darce choke, and Woodley tapped again towards the end of the very first round, which definitely sucked to see, but. Luque seems like a very promising title contender within that welterweight division. It was a really impressive win. And it actually got fight of the night bonus 
And I forgot to say before, the Sugar Sean O'Malley and Thomas Almeida fight got performance of the night. Or O'Malley did, rather. But the fight of the night was awarded to this Tyron Woodley and Vincent Luque fight. And Dana even mentioned it in post-fight uh, press conferences that it was like Woodley's... Dana said fourth uh, loss in a row. I think it's third, though. Um, and mentioned that Woodley's 39 years old and it may, may be time for, for him to hang it up. But Dana has always had like this ongoing like feud beef with Woodley. They've had like back and forth. So we'll see what happens with that. Now on to the main event of the evening, which also got a fight of the night bonus which for those of you who don't know that means each fighter gets an extra fifty thousand dollars for putting on a dope performance for the heavyweight championship stipe miocic and francis Ngannou. which by the way if you guys haven't heard rogan's podcast with francis definitely check it out what that dude went through migrating from cameroon and the multiple attempts and the poverty that it came from, from like to the point that like he used to walk like miles barefoot to school and his family didn't even, didn't have a pen or paper for him to go to school. Um, like crazy shit. But he was able to like escape that poverty and migrate through like rafts and like canoes and like hiding in the water and getting to like different countries and eventually, and he got caught multiple times and sent back and then eventually made it to like France, I believe it was. And it's it's nuts. It's a crazy story. You guys should check it out. But yeah, this is their second fight. Stipe in the first fight was able to stop Francis. Surprising to most because Francis has like the most amazing one punch knockout power that I think we've ever seen. But Stipe obviously has the experience. Was able to endure a couple of Francis's punches, take him to the ground, out wrestle him, and just keep him on the ground with his skill. Stipe is obviously no slouch most decorated heavyweight in UFC history has defended the heavyweight championship more times than, than any other heavyweight has been able to. He's also a firefighter back in, in Cleveland, which he still is <laughs> like while being an active UFC heavyweight champion, this guy's like fucking mother Teresa in the body of a fucking killer UFC fighter. So Nganu noticeably caught Stipe a couple times at a couple strikes in the first round. And Stipe tried to take him down, and Francis showed surprising and perfect takedown defense. And Stipe was not able to take him down, as he did during the first fight when he took him down, I wrestled him, etc. They continued to exchange back and forth. Then in the second round, it was more of that. And Stipe steam seemed to stun Nganu, standing up, striking. It looked like, to me, when Stipe went in, like for the kill, kind of, when he noticed, oh, I heard him, let me swarm and see if I can stop him and end this fight. And Ghana was able to, while he was like backpedaling, backtracking a little bit, and Stipe was coming in, and Ghana was able to throw one of his massive power punches and just stop Stipe in his tracks. And then from there, he regained his composure. Stipe was out of it. And Ghana swarmed, caught him a couple more times. And just knocked him out. And he even at the end, again, testament to what I was saying earlier, in the heat of battle type of thing, and until the ref stops you, and the ref always steps, says, don't stop until I stop you, don't stop the fight until I stop you, Francis kept going, but Stipe was like, out. Knocked down, and Francis did a like Dan Hendo-style hammer fist on Stipe after he was knocked down on the ground before Herb Dean was able to like reach them and stop the fight. But hats off to those two guys. Hell of a fight. We got a new heavyweight champion in Francis Ngannou. We got three champions in the UFC representing Africa now. And Francis Ngannou, Kamaru Usman, and Israel Stylebender Adesanya. Hats off to all those guys. And that is UFC 260. Zack Snyder's Justice League. Here's the official synopsis. Determined to ensure Superman's ultimate sacrifice was not in vain, Bruce Wayne aligns forces with Diana Prince with plans to recruit a team of metahumans to protect the world from an approaching threat of catastrophic proportions. As always, let's give a shout out to the writers, starting with Zack Snyder, Chris Terrio, and Will Beal. The story is by those folks. 
and the screenplay by Chris Terrio. Now, this movie has a really interesting background in that Justice League, the movie, was originally released in 2017. And it was a movie that Zack Snyder began filming, but stepped away from towards like the middle or two thirds of the way through the movie. Now, I didn't know this. My brother put me onto this. The reason why he had to step away was due to the unexpected, untimely death of his daughter. Now, what happened thereafter is that Warner brought in Joss Whedon to finish the film. Joss Whedon wound up cutting like two hours out of the film because it was going to be very long. And he reshot and rewrote a bunch of scenes. And a lot of the... It, it wasn't widely accepted as a, as a you know, good movie in 2017. I barely remember watching it. I remember liking it and thinking, oh, it was, it was pretty good. You know, no Avengers or whatever, but, you know, what DC movies are. Besides, like, Batman and Superman. But I remember, whatever, not hating it. Um, but I also forgot it. Like, forgot it existed completely. And when this movie came out, I was like, oh, shit, what a dope idea. <laughs> and while watching the movie, I'm like having like deja vu because there's like obviously a bunch of scenes from the original 2017 footage from it that were in the 2021 version but a lot of the critiques from it were that they didn't go into the background stories at all of a lot of the characters especially characters that were first being featured for the first time like cyborg and the flash and even aquaman I, i i think the first aquaman movie hadn't even come out yet you know how marvel did like iron man movies captain america movies Spider-Man movies, etc. before doing like the Avengers altogether. This was like the exact opposite. And the actors, Ben Affleck, Henry Cavill that played Superman, a lot of them were very unhappy and didn't want to be associated with the film after it came out. Then there were rumblings online, followed by a bunch of like fan support that there w- was another quote unquote Snyder cut, like the guy that Zack Snyder that was originally directing and, and filming this, that had to step away. And there was a a large push from fans to release the Snyder Cut, the Snyder version. After so much attention, and Zack Snyder obviously willing to, Warner wound up giving him $70 million to reshoot and refinish his original vision for the film, which gave us the Zack Snyder's Justice League Cut in 2021, which is four hours and two minutes long. It's like on one hand, no wonder Joss Whedon saw that and was like, cut half of it. But honestly, on the flip side, I saw it, really liked it, really enjoyed it, and I was not bored at all. I really liked from the film also that it was dark. It was like they showed blood, uh, there was cursing in it. It wasn't like a PG-13 made-for-kids like comic movie. It was much more graphic novel-like. From the very first scene with Ben Affleck and Jason Momoa, Bruce Wayne and Aquaman, I was like hooked into the movie. I thought it was like a, a really dope dialogue exchange between the two. Aquaman like made, made fun of him in a scene saying, so you do it dressed as a bat? And Bruce Wayne is like, yeah, hey, I worked in Gotham for like 20 years. And Aquaman's like, oh, Gotham, that shit hole. And I have a question, by the way. If Aquaman takes off his shirt before every time before he goes into the water, which he clearly does because he's bodied up, how does he always have a shirt when he comes back out of the water? Does he just have like stashes of clothes lying around and shit? Anyway, uh, the main villain that we see, Steppenwolf, which is not, which is like the main villain that we see, but he's not like the head villain. Um, the head bad guy is like some guy called Darkseid. I think I'm getting that right. And we barely see him, but he's the one that Steppenwolf is like reporting to. But he's a dope looking super villain. Like just the way he looks, he's like all like armored up and doesn't look cheesy at all like he looks like a cool character and has great fight scenes especially the first one with the amazonians and they're like attacking him you know they're on their horses and and their bows and their lassos and shit he's like running through them and grabbing horses and like flipping horses over with them on it sick dope scene a lot of the fighting scenes like throughout the movie were were like really really good I like the Barry Allen's character, uh, the Flash. He was like smart and, and funny. He was kind of like spectrumish, but definitely provided a lot of the comedic relief in the movie. Victor Stone's character, which I'm not familiar with, like comic book wise or anything like that, but he played Cyborg. His character w- was interesting. He was like, he could control anything and everything, like digitally, but 
couldn't really control himself like didn't really have like emotional control that was like at least what i saw within his character arc uh there was a scene also where i have a question um when they were climbing out of the tunnel in that night crawler machine thing that batman had and aquaman was like holding off like the water that was like pouring into the tunnel why didn't wonder woman just fly out she was like holding onto the machine and they were like all like holding on for dear life while the machine was climbing them out of there but couldn't she just fly either i'm I'm missing something with her abilities or they fucked up with that uh ben affleck i think is a really really good bruce wayne and i liked him before as batman but in this movie I, i thought he was a horrible batman sorry ben but as bruce wayne he was probably at the top of the list of like dope bruce wayne's towards the top of the list because michael keaton right one of his great like batman scenes though was his like luring away of like the those insects that were with steppenwolf those like flying creatures luring them away that was like a, a dope scene in batmobile and him like fighting them off and what they shot really in a great way that kind of like immersed you within it and like you visually just got what was going on was the flashes running scenes with how everything around him slows down and you have like the electrical lightning looking pulses all around him like that was very visually like on point like you got what was going on when you saw that and it didn't look cheesy like it looked really good like it looked really good it was a couple other things that i didn't like like the naming of certain things which just seemed like lazy but maybe that that was just like carryover from comic books i don't know but like the thing they were they were hunting was an quote unquote anti life machine or anti life something. Um, there was a character called Martian Manhunter, which just sounds like a corny name. I have no idea who he is, but he kind of looked like Vision from from the Marvel universe. There was a lot a lot of father son stuff within the movie, which you all know if you listen to this podcast. I'm a sap for uh, between Victor and his dad, between Barry and his dad, who was in jail between superman and his father's technically his real father or biological father and his adopted father here on earth and spoiler alert if you haven't seen it the way that they killed steppenwolf at the end the justice league like literally made me just like say fuck yeah it was like a dope fight sequence and like teamwork and they just chopped this fucking head off at the end and like showed the blood and a little bit of the gore, not too much, but it was dope. And then his head just like rolls onto the ground. Like it goes through this like time portal thing or like worm home, worm hole portal thing. And the head bad guy just like steps on his head. Like I knew he would fail type of thing. And he like kind of like catches his head with his foot, like a soccer ball type of thing and just steps on it. It was a dope, dope scene. And then lastly at the end, it was like, um, there was like a Bruce Wayne dream sequence uh, scene going on and Jared Leto's Joker is in it, which is interesting because Jared, Jared Leto's Joker from, uh, what was it called? Suicide Squad. He like looks wise. Like I liked it. Like he could pull off like a modern day Joker, but like the character, like the modernization kind of of the character, like I really didn't like, or at least I don't now. Uh, but in this scene, it was like kind of interesting to like see them interact, and it was like a weird. A lot of things were going going on in that. I got to dig deeper into like that final dream sequence thing that was going on to see all like the Easter eggs and stuff like that. Of uh, folks that know a lot more about like that comic book world, but it seemed like setting up a lot of possibilities to come, and it was like a cum- culmination of Bruce's like inner demons. But yeah, man. It was a dope movie. I definitely recommend that you guys should check it out. It's four hours long, but I still recommend it. Maybe in a couple sittings for you guys, but I saw it in one sitting and thought it was great. Zack Snyder's Justice League. Check it out. And folks, that is episode 177 of the Spun Today podcast. Thank you very much for rocking out with me. Let me know what you thought. Hit me up on social media at Spun Today on Twitter and Instagram. And stay tuned to listen to a few ways you can help support this show. Peace. Hey folks, Tony here. If you're enjoying the show, do me a favor. 
rate and review it on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to help out the show in other ways, I'll give you a one-stop shop of sorts to do so. Go to spuntoday.com forward slash support. That's where you'll find a ton of different ways to help support this show, such as shopping on Amazon. If you do any shopping on Amazon, like most of the world, I ask that you do so by clicking on any of the Amazon banners on my website. This will take you to Amazon where you can do your shopping like you normally do. It will not cost you anything extra, but I will get credit for driving traffic to their website. Speaking of Amazon, they fulfill a bunch of the merch that I have available. If you go to spuntray.com forward slash support, you're going to find a brand new merch section where you'll find the iconic Podcasts vs. Anybody Super Soft Premium Cotton T-Shirt. You'll also find the legendary Spun Today Podcast tee, which is in the style of the New York City Plastic Thank You Bags logo. For my fellow Dominicans out there, I have a dope Dominican Escudo t-shirt. You know where the Lacoste or Polo shirts have their little logo? Picture that, but instead, a Dominican Escudo. All available now in a variety of different colors for men and women in all sizes. In the Spun Today merch section, which again is at spuntoday.com forward slash support, you'll also find a bunch of other t-shirt designs, long sleeve t-shirts, short sleeve t-shirts, color changing coffee mugs, and much, much more. Check out all the merch at spuntoday.com forward slash support. All of my short stories can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash short stories. The free writing pieces that I read, share, and review during the free writing session episodes of this show can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash free writing. There you can read all the pieces that made the podcast as well as tons and tons of others. My books are available in any digital format of your choice, whether it's Kindle, Apple's iBooks, Kobo, you name it. They're also available in paperback. You can check them out at spuntoday.com forward slash books. My debut novel, Fractal, is a sci-fi time travel story of a group of righteous travelers that attempt to right the wrongs of the injustices of the past. My nonfiction, Make Way For You, is a collection of tips for getting out of your own way. So if you need some motivation, inspiration, and a good old-fashioned kick in the ass, that'll be the read for you. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash books or search for those titles on Amazon. Another great and free way that you can help support this show is by subscribing to my newsletter by going to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe. You'll get a photo, podcast, video, quote, and word of the week every single Monday at noon. What else do you have to look forward to on a Monday? Plus, you'll be the first to know whenever I publish a new book. And if for whatever reason you choose to, you can unsubscribe at any time. Go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe, drop in your email address, and you'll get the very next one. At spuntoday.com forward slash support, you'll also find links to my Patreon, Ko-fi, and PayPal donation pages. Patreon and Ko-fi allow you to make recurring donations per episode, and you even get some bonus content for doing so. PayPal allows you to make a one-time donation to the show for my fellow writers and creatives out there a really cool way for you to be featured on this show is to respond to my five question spun today questionnaire i'll read your responses on a future episode of the show and share them with the spun today community think about it if your responses could potentially spark inspiration in someone else why not share that to do so go to spun today.com forward slash questionnaire don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Spun Today on both those platforms. Check out and like the Spun Today Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Spun Today. I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to the Spun Today YouTube page. Just search for Spun Today on YouTube or click on any of the YouTube icons on my website. There you'll not only get the full versions of this podcast, but you'll also get bonus content like shortened episode clips, and much, much more. And as always, folks, substitute the mysticism 
with hard work and start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams. Thanks for listening. I love you, Aiden. I love you, Daddy.